Robinhood Radio and the Robinhood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. When Orson Welles died in 1985, he left behind a body of work that ranked him as one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, despite the fact that he had finished his last film almost three decades before, and his later years were marked by a sense of early promise unfulfilled. Frank B. Meacham, Frank Beecham uh, worked with Wells in the last year of his life, and now he's co-written a play about that time with George Demas, uh, who also co-directs and stars as Wells. The play is called Maverick, and it's on stage at the Connolly Theater in the East Village until March 2nd. I'm delighted it has brought Frank Beecham and George Demas to our show now. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank Fra- you for having us. Frank, you worked with... Uh, Wells as uh, on one of his last unfinished projects. Uh, that was over 30 years ago. What led you to write about that now? Although you've done some other things in the in the intervening years. Yeah. No. I what happened was that George and I really began to do work on this about 18 years ago. Oh wow! And it was interesting. George was doing a a play about Dorothy Parker. And I had mentioned uh, to him and a couple of people after the show that that Orson had uh, gotten Lucille Ball to do Dorothy's stuff on radio. And the whole question came up, and one of the uh, theater directors there suggested we write something. Mm. And we did. And this is the way it came out. And you found the collaboration worked well for both of you because that's the hardest thing to pull off it's been wonderful george has nailed orson to a point that it's eerie for me yeah george your performance of wells feels spot on did you ever meet him Uh, orson wells yeah except in the movies oh no i only know him through um uh, recordings and youtube and of course citizen kate and the films he did how do you approach playing a man who's so recognizable especially (laughs) the voice uh, well, I, I mean, you you have you bear a physical resemblance well, to it, some degree. I'm I'm lucky in the fact that a lot of times when you play a, a figure that's well known, there's not a lot of material on them speaking extemporaneously like you would, if, you know. But there's so much of it on on Wells, so you could you you really can get a sense of him as a person. In the, his cadences, the pace of his thinking, is certainly something that's hard to keep up with. Um, but there's a lot out there to look at and to uh, – and also, too, you, you kind of bite into the things that you identify with and, and feel that you can convey. Was getting that voice right the key to the poor uh, – a major key to the Well, I mean, I made it clear to the company of what we're doing that we're not doing Night of a Thousand Voices <laughs> here, but that, but that you, we wanted the, these characters to be seasoned with the, the essence of them. Frank, how did you meet Orson Welles? How old uh, were you at the time? I was 35. Uh, I was doing Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous in Hollywood. You were doing, uh, you were producing the show? I, I was not producing, but I did the all the production. I, I had a facility there that was based on the beta cam that Sony had built for us, and it was the only facility that could do the show economically enough, and so what happened was Wells found out that we were working on this uh, through one of my freelance editors. And one day I get a call from the voice of God, to, would I like to have lunch with him? And this is how it all began. It must have been a shock because I assumed that you had ambitions to do more than work on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Oh, well, that's exactly it. And it's a core of what the play is about is I had one foot in the, the, the lifestyles uh, thing with Robin Leach and the other foot in a creative nirvana with Orson Welles, and I'm being pulled apart, and uh, Welles won. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Frank, can I mention the, the uh, Cradle Will Rock and 
vis-a-vis how sure. Orson. Well, uh, one salient fact that was missed in what Frank was saying was that Frank was not happy. He, Frank was executive producer of the Tim Robbins film Cradle Will Rock, and he was not yes. happy with how Wells was treated or portrayed in that film, ultimately. And he, you were on contract with Disney. You couldn't say anything bad about the movie. And so Frank's idea of revisionism was to write a play to kind of hopefully set That's the record true. straight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that beta cam. Was that the first handheld video camera recorder? That was. We had serial number three. I had gotten it from Sony. They had no purpose for it at the time. It weighed about 30 pounds. And if you can think of a... It sounded lightweight at the time because it was. Uh, today, an iPhone performs better. But we wanted to do entertainment with it, and it had been invented for news. And I went to Sony, and I said, look, we could do this, but you got to build me a, a room that will work. And they did. Uh, and I come up with $75,000, and they give me a, a million-dollar edit bay. And that's how we did it. Although, at that time, you couldn't have imagined that a smartphone could do all those things. No, you couldn't, but, but it was pretty amazing that the Betacam could. And it's interesting, we have an original Betacam in the play, uh, and that Betacam I got on eBay for like $100, and, and they're impossible to find. If something were to happen to it, we'd be uh, dead. In uh, a character, uh, well, the point is made in the play that the new technology is great because it's so cheap that it'll democratize filmmaking. That was my naive view at the time. But then Wells says that making filmmaking so accessible might not be a good thing because you might not like what you see. Well, as in most <laughs> things that Orson said at the time, uh, he was dead on right. I... Uh, I was naive. I, I got into video because I thought it would change the world. I thought that it would democratize video, and I thought that would be a good thing. Now I don't believe that anymore. Well, we, we get some wonderful stuff. Because, oh, we do. Because we do. Uh, people just will film things that they are witnessing on the highway or elsewhere uh, that we would not know about otherwise. That's true, and it's it's had its... You know, it's, it's, it's like one of these things that cuts both ways. Yeah, and the flip side, you get reality TV, mm -hmm. which would not be financially producible. Yeah, and also, I, I was one of the forefathers or forefounders of that, and that was one of the things I didn't like. Are you still feeling All guilty this, about it? Yeah, I do. You know, if people say, I remember your credit on that mm -hmm. show, and I, I, you know, it always bothers me. That, that's a legacy. Although Wells was highly respected as a director, did his films ever make any money? Well, Citizen Kane, Kane, Kane has. And, yeah, but uh, it, it didn't initially. Uh, no, in fact, it took seven years. Well, it didn't help that William Randolph Hearst forbade all of his newspapers from running ads for the film. Mm. No, it never made money initially, but it's made a lot of money over the years. Uh, I would say most of Wells' films have not made a lot of money. Most of them are artistic successes like uh, F for Fake is one of the mm -hmm. best documentaries ever made. Um, and of course his radio and his theater stuff. I mean, the man was an inventor. Uh, you have to look at these films for what they broke at the time uh, that had never been done before. That, that's the critical way to watch a Wells film. Uh, and we, I just sent George a thing yesterday about uh, some uh, young person had picked the five best Wells films and picked Transformer as one of them. And, I mean, Wells would be rolling in his grave if he ever heard that. <laughs> it's terrible. But he did make some wonderful films, although he always had problems with Hollywood. The Magnificent Ambersons, which uh, we can only guess. Well, hasn't a, a final, a new cut been made that was what he wanted? Uh, but no, the, the not studio Ambersons, really messed, up, messed it up. Well, what happened with Ambersons is that they lost, uh, the, the footage was destroyed. Um, Wells was sent to do a... Um, the show called It's All True in Latin America by Nelson Rockefeller, of all people. And they recut Ambersons when he was gone, and, and then the footage was lost. So Ambersons has never been what Wells wanted. And it was an interesting story that Oya Kodar, his mistress in the home where he died, said that uh, Wells would occasionally see the film. It'd come on television, 
and he would weep mm. watching it. I mean, it really upset him. It is amazing that he made so many great films, and uh, the only people who really appreciate them are, are film buffs. Well, you know, that's the difficulty of, of a great director. Uh, when you study Wells and you look at what he did that was never done before he did it, it becomes incredible. Did, I, I, so, I, I mean, what he did in uh, with War of the Worlds, for example, he, was, he saw radio as a, as a uh, symphony conductor, and he would stand on a podium and, and, and treat it like an orchestra, and he would mix the actors, the music, and the sound effects and do it on the fly. And it was really amazing how he did that. And, of course, War of the Worlds is one of the legendary radio broadcasts because it sent many people into a panic. It did, and but what was unique, it was done that realistically that they really believed that, that we're being invaded by Martians? Absolutely, it did. But what's interesting is the afternoon that the show was done, they did a rehearsal in which Wells said it's one of the worst pieces <laughs> the Mercury had ever done. That night they were in a bar. Wells said, "Let's stretch, put dead air in what was a no-no at the time." You had to have tight production. He made it, dragged it out, and that made it, gave it a tension. And it's one of those instances where Wells was able to take total disaster and turn it around and make it a total triumph. I mean, he also did. Right. He did that all the time. Yeah. I mean, did, he did, did, it that, and, did that make him famous? I mean, he was already well known, but uh, that was uh, a major s news story. It was, but he had already scored with um, the Mercury Theater. He was doing things like putting live microphones in restrooms in order to get <laughs> the sewers of Paris, you know, the, the ambience. He took a rifle and fired it off the roof of a building in New York City and, and, and put it on the air. He did things that were nobody was doing. I, I mean, it was really remarkable. Did the new technology of video appeal to him because it was less expensive than films? Because the video, a major you, don't, you don't have to buy film stock, you don't have to pay for yes. processing. That Although the major. quality is not wasn't as as he didn't great at care the time. about the quality. He he uh, he he was somebody who said he was an amateur at heart. Uh, he felt that the image could be made with any kind of uh, palette. You just had to just choose what you wanted to do with it. So it didn't matter to him. And I think he had also seen, like, in the year we're dealing with, mostly 1985, that two years prior, Olivier had done a very successful King Lear on video. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, those were the big cameras that had studio cameras, but I think he saw that there was a lot that he could do with Lear and, and the type of material he wanted to do with video. One of the other th things that uh, makes it different is it's immediate because you can see the results instantly. Oh, yeah. He saw the Betacam as an Aeroflex without film. And that's, uh, that's the way he, he saw video. He liked the immediacy. He didn't want to pay for the film stock. He felt that, in a way, video freed him from the constraints of the budget counters, and, and he called them the bean counters. Mm -hmm. And I... What appealed to me was, hey, Orson Welles has reinvented radio, theater, film. He might reinvent video, and I'll be there with him. And that was what was exciting to me. We can only imagine what might have actually happened. Oh, yeah. No, I think about it all the time. Mm -hmm. If Welles had lived, say, 20 years longer, and he could have worked with small format video gear, um, he's liable to have done some of his best work. We don't know. Uh, he dies the, the night before we just start at our typewriter, at my typewriter with my script in it. And it was, uh, it was really uh, a terrible thing. I mean, it was a, a total loss. We never got anything. He had been ill, right? But he had a heart attack. At, he's only 70 he years heart, old at yeah, the time. Yeah, I know. And we didn't know he was ill. He, was, he had told me that he couldn't eat um he couldn't drink and eat rich foods. I mean, he was eating, uh, he was insisting that I eat for him. Mm -hmm. But I never f sensed that he was near death. Never. I'm, I'm speaking with Frank Beecham and George Dimas uh, about uh, 
Orson Welles. Uh, they have co-written a play called Maverick, which is currently on stage at the Connolly Theater at 220 East 4th Street in the East Village. Only a, a few more weeks. It, it runs until March, yeah, March 2nd. March 2nd, yeah. And this is Leonard Lopez at Large at W. BAI New York 99.5 FM I'm Leonard Lopate so well, let's talk about that that meeting your first meeting with Wells he insisted that you drink wine even though he could no longer drink wine and then he ordered you uh, he ordered you the the warm lobster salad because he thinks you had to experience it that well, really happened? Yeah, that really happened, yeah. That and sounds all, like a control freak. Yeah, well, he, he, he was. Uh, he also had his little dog, Cheeky, there, who bit me. Uh, and he bites me in the play. Um, and you had Orson, to train the dog to to, to bite? You, you like being bitten every night? No, actually, uh, George, George, George la- and Orson laughed uh-huh. when Tiki bit me uh-huh. because he thought it was funny, and it was my first flavor of Orson's humor. Mm -hmm. I I realized that, you know, I couldn't kick the dog. (laughs) You can't hit Orson Welles' dog, so you just have to endure the pain. And uh, it wasn't that big a deal, but it when he laughed, I thought, wow, that's, uh, now we got an interesting guy here. (laughs) So did you like the lobster salad? Uh, Yeah, Mm -hmm. the lobster salad was really quite good. I never thought about food when I was eating with Orson. Orson you had to be on your toes when you ate with Orson. He was a guy who didn't want to hear any bull. He wanted. He didn't want to have a, a conversation in a, uh, a light way. However, I think the reason I hit it off with him was I didn't know much about him in the beginning except radio because I'd come from radio. And we really bonded over the radio uh, because he thought it was the best, most creative work he ever did because there wasn't much money in it. And that's what he, uh, he, he loved. Well, the, the other thing that makes radio wonderful and the thing that I miss most about the radio dramas uh, of my youth is your imagination fills in all the details. Absolutely. And with film and with television, Everything is laid out for you. He called it the theater of the imagination. So what was the, the first project you worked on with him? Well, that, that, the one that we worked on was the one that took a year, and that was the one in the play. It was to be called Orson Welles Solo. It was a magic show. And Orson had done films in, after World War II where he sawed Rita Hayworth in half, and he was going to use some of those clips along with new footage that he did, and he was going to float a human body over the audience, and he was going to do all these things. And he kept escalating the budget, which put pressure on me to raise money for him. And uh, needless to say, I didn't have the money until the last moment. But I had to keep telling Orson I did because he, he would walk away if I didn't. So he was he wanted to film a live magic show that was done at the UCLA Theater. Right, and he wanted to uh, he wanted the beta cams to float around the room and um, and be able to intercut with them. They didn't quite work at the time, and I had Sony coming in with their engineers to try to ensure that it did work. And it was, uh, look, it was a wild roller coaster. I didn't have the money. I didn't know if it, the technology would work, but I was not going to say no to Orson Welles. Was raising the money made more difficult by the fact that Welles refused to release scripts or allow investors to visit sets? Oh, yeah. No, Orson would not give any of us a script. Um, HBO had offered him the money, and he said, no, they're a bunch of bean counters. I don't want them there. I want you. Now, the reason he wanted me is he could control me. I knew this. but um, And I had learned this whole concept of being a slave uh, <laughs> because I knew from John Houseman that, you know, how it – Turns out, you know. Well, you had spoken to John Houseman about working oh, yeah, with Orson Welles. Oh, yeah, no, I had spoken to John Houseman, and I, uh, I, in fact, had made a mistake of giving Houseman a script that Orson wrote, of which Houseman was furious. So I got caught in the middle out of being purely too naive. However, I did know, I was very aware that I was being used, but I was going to go anyway because I wanted to be on his train in the roller coaster. An early scene shows you going to a bank to request a line of credit. 
were there many banks willing to lend money no, to Wells? No, no one would. But it was uh, it's it's kind of a a thing to show that you know there's no way because I had no collateral. I didn't know what the script was. I didn't know uh, anything. I didn't know what the show was. I mean, it was absurd. Also, on a dramaturgical level, it's quite convenient to have a character interviewing for a bank loan to get certain information out there. <laughs> yes. Well, you, you use flashbacks as a way of telling the story. Yeah. Now, Orson told me at once one day that Picasso had done, uh, could do a painting that um, basically he'd get $4 million for and not, not have to tell anybody what it would be. He, in advance, he would get right, the money. Right, he'd get the money in advance. And Orson always thought he was equal to Picasso. He knew him and all of this. And he said, why can't I have this money? And that's the pitch I used to ra- actually raise the money, which was absurd, but it worked. On the other hand, Orson Welles was one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. He would have thought that people would have appreciated that. Well, we Weren't have there a- any fans out there who had money? Well, Today, with social media, probably. He could be raising money online. But there was no social media then. In fact, he tried to get money from other directors who would have lunch with him and want to appeal to his... um, You know, they wanted to know things that would interest them, but they didn't want to... uh, to, to give him any money or help him get money. I mean, one of the things is, is that the resource that these people have is money. The resource they don't have is time. And probably working with Wells would promise to be a, a pretty big time suck, and I think mm-hmm. maybe that was part of the reason. Even if he worked in video, and uh, sure. that, that shortened the, the time. Yeah. He also wanted to do a King Lear? He wanted but, to do King Lear. He was trying to do King Lear, and he did a pitch tape for for directors. He would have been a great Lear. He would have, but at that stage of his life, nobody wanted to touch him. He really had become so polarized about the funding and producers and money that this is what prohibited a lot of people from taking him seriously. Now, I will tell you that I, I think it was Steven Spielberg that bought the sled from Citizen Kane as a prop for 75000 Because I told him at lunch one day, I showed him the trades, and he got so upset about that because he, he, he felt that here people would give money for a prop from an old film, but they wouldn't give it to him as a living director. And it's weird because Rosebud, everybody knows what Rosebud means. Uh, so he, because he's such a, uh, become such a, important part of the popular culture right. despite the fact that he had all these problems right no it's a, it's a, he, he was a, a mixed bag let's say that well he yeah. it, it, with citizen kane and i don't know if a lot of people know this but the heads of all the studios not just rko all of them met in new york and this is verified by robert wise who was an editor and also became pretty head good of director the, yeah um th- that they all met to decide whether to release Citizen Kane or not. And Robert Wise says that the greatest performance Wells ever gave was in his speech to these studio heads about releasing the movie. They ultimately decided to do it, but I have a feeling that it was not the last time that that group of people got together about the threat that he posed potentially to the business. But that was because they were afraid of William Randolph Hearst. Yes, and they couldn't get their films He was one of the most powerful publishers newspaper publishers in the country, and uh, he could have uh, gotten revenge for all of the the films that they wanted to release from then on. Sure, but they were in a sticky place because Wells had such a contract and had such control over the post-production that you could say, yeah, we'll give him... We'll give him the movie, and he can burn it. But you, they wouldn't know that Wells didn't necessarily have another copy mm-hmm. because it was so secretive, so closed from his contract that he could have had another copy of the film. But One of the, uh, the, the uh, scenes shows him speaking with a reporter who's surprised to learn that Wells is from Kenosha, Wisconsin. Yeah, we don't think of him as somebody from Wisconsin, but... Wasn't he also involved in politics in Wisconsin? Oh, yeah. He ran, uh, he, he thought of running for the U.S. Senate. He was involved in politics even back to the point he wrote uh, a number of uh, Roosevelt's fireside chats. 
they wanted him to run for the U.S. Senate from Wisconsin, and um, he decided not to. But Joseph McCarthy, the, uh, the senator, got elected. There's a wonderful bit in the play where Orson says, well, you know, uh, I wanted, they wanted me to testify uh, before the House Un-American Activities Committee, and I, I asked him to, to let me do it. I said, get as many cameras there as you can because I, I really want to, to tell the nation what's going on here. And, of course, McCarthy doesn't ask him because he's afraid of Orson. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, Orson probably would have had a great career in politics if he hadn't, uh, you and know, we, hadn't had the temperament he had. He, he had a and we might have been column. spared Joseph McCarthy. He had a political column for the Post, but was fired in kind of that six month period when anybody to the left was fired. And he also did a lot of political commentary. Well, by the we should point out that the New York Post in those days was considered a very liberal newspaper. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. But. It was and, uh, until Rupert Murdoch bought it. In fact, it was uh, pretty much a, uh, a liberal newspaper. It was the leftist newspaper as opposed to the, well, the news had gone from a supporter of FDR to uh, a opponent. Uh, and then we had the Trib, which was a Republican newspaper. And then there were the Hearst Papers Journal and the Journal American. Uh, so uh, the Post was the, the, the paper that all of the, the liberals read. Yes, yeah, so well, he talked about uh, in this. I don't in fact, know if Eleanor Roosevelt had a column in it. Oh, hmm. well, uh, no, he, he he was fired from from it when everybody to the left was fired, and just didn't go back to it. It didn't spark his interest. To be political. his his family, his uh, his his parents died when he was a child, but his mother was a concert pianist. Uh, she died when he was nine, and his father uh, was an inventor, and he died when uh, Wells was fifteen. So did that give him the freedom to reinvent himself? Well, he went to a school called the Todd School for Boys, and um, he started doing Shakespeare there. And um, Roger Hill, who was a teacher, encouraged him, and he went on to to go to England and be uh, with a major theater company there. It was Ireland. In In Ireland, I'm sorry, yeah. And he, um, he grew a beard, he smoked a cigar to look older, and he just dived right in, and he he wrote a uh, a book about Shakespeare when he was a kid. I mean, he just I think everyone saw him as a prodigy and who was a genius uh, in his early days, and he was a genius. I mean, you look at what he did before he was thirty years old; it's amazing. But he really makes his name in radio. Did he give up the theater? Well, no, no. He he did radio first, but he was doing theater simultaneously. He, when he was fired from radio, which uh, came when he did Cradle of Rock, the uh, play that the government tried to shut down, he and uh, Mark Blitzstein went away. They created a name, the Mercury Theater of the Air. He went on to do that. That's where War of the Worlds came. And from that, it's interesting, John Houseman told me a story that he said he figured that when uh, Wells um, sold Martians landing to the mass audience, that Campbell's Soup Company figured he could sell people on uh, Campbell's Chicken Soup. And that's how he got the contract in Hollywood. It went on, and Campbell's Soup sponsored him, and he went on to have a big career. He had a joke that they, in South America they tried to do the same thing with Martians landing, and the people were sent to prison. But when he did it, he was sent to Hollywood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was 1938 when he did that show. Right, right. But you include flashbacks to his time working with Houseman, and it shows Wells being rather abusive. To oh, he John was. Houseman. He was very abusive to Houseman. In fact, uh, even as a young man, he was kind of yeah, demanding. Their, and their relationship ended in uh, a restaurant called Chasen's in Hollywood. When Orson set the uh, the curtains on fire, throwing cans of Sterno at uh, at Houseman, and that's uh, when they ended the relationship. It was turbulent. Um, Houseman, when he was younger, felt that he was latching on to a creative genius, which he was. But as they got older, they uh, they just went different paths, and Houseman um, really hated. The fact that Wells had, you know, taken a lot of credit from him. But it was interesting because Wells 
figured that when Hausman wrote all of his books about their relationship, that Hausman was defining history. And he, that's, and he couldn't write a book. And the reason he couldn't write a book is he sold it so many times <laughs> that he, uh, didn't, he couldn't write it. He'd be sued. It was, it was a, he was in a bind. It, it, a lot of his situations were hilarious in, in, in a certain way. I interviewed John Hausman uh, not long before he died. And, uh, my memories of him are as a very nice person, but you never know. <laughs> People are on their best behavior when they come on a radio show. Right. Uh, George, you portray Wells as rude and dismissive toward the people he worked with in general, but then he turns on a dime and becomes charming and self-deprecating. Did that usually work for him? Uh, y- yeah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I know in this documentary, They'll Love Me, when I'm dead, which is out right now, that people would talk about how you would be driven to the point with him, working with him, that you would say, listen, fat guy, you can take your project and put it where the sun don't shine. And when you were just about to do that, you would feel his arm draping around your shoulder and he would say, have I told you about what a good job you're doing for me? And he just knew how to, how to push people to the limit and calibrate all of that so he could... And the charm he could turn on was unbelievable. You can only wonder what he would have been like in, in the era of Netflix, which is oh. showing that documentary about him. Yes, yes. I mean, and what he could have done with an iPhone. <laughs> You're listening to Leonard Lopate at Large on WBAI, New York 99.5 FM. Last night, I journeyed backwards in time to the medieval world of Dark Tower. In this amazing game, I had to find three keys, lay siege to the tower, and defeat the enemy within. Each move was a challenge. The computer kept track, giving me secret information, pictures, sounds, surprises. Then, ahead of my opponent, I made my move. The battle was joined, and I was victorious. Dark Tower. I like to cast a party the way I cast a play with very special people, and the champagne was equally special. Paul Masson, a premium California champagne of impeccable taste. Paul Masson wines taste so good because they're made with such care. Old Paul Masson himself said it nearly a century ago, we will sell no wine before it's time. You know, sometimes I feel like Orson Welles attempting to raise money for causes late in life that I believe in, like the the show we're bringing you every weekday from 1 to 2 p.m. on WBAI. And I strongly believe in the station's 100% listener-supported business model. But if you want to make sure the show goes on and I'm not relegated to doing cheap wine commercials, I need everyone listening right now who's not a member of WBAI to go to the phone or a computer right now and make a contribution of any amount that you feel comfortable with. Uh, the number to call is 516-620-3602 or go to give to wbaiorg That's give and then the number two, wbaiorg The point is that you're supporting a station that doesn't take ads and doesn't take corporate funding of any kind. uh, We have um, received a number of uh, wonderful pledges uh, yesterday, and I'd like to give thanks to some of the people. Um, uh, A couple of anonymous ones, one $100 from Long Valley, New Jersey, another uh, $25 from a listener in Hoboken, $100 from Jesse Howe of Merrick, New York, $25 $25 from Alan James of Brooklyn, New York, uh, $50 from Alan Frederick of Floral Park, New York. And none of those um, were uh, uh, w- led to sustaining membership, but uh, we are very happy with any level you are comfortable giving. Right now, the uh, we're in the midst of this winter fund drive, which is currently scheduled to run for the entire month, but it could go long if we don't meet our goal of $300,000. We hope that we can end it a lot sooner sooner, and, and be able to return to doing the show uninterrupted. But the good news is that we're attempting to raise uh, amounts that are much less in, than most public radio stations, and this drive can be over today if we met our goal of $300,000. So here's where you come in. If you've probably heard 
BAI relies totally on the support of our listeners to pay our bills. We don't run ads, what other public great broadcasters euphemistically call funding credits. In Great Britain, everyone has to pay a licensing fee of 90 pounds uh, to support public broadcasting, whether they uh, take advantage of it or not. And that comes to about $120 a year, which is the amount, the same basic amount that we ask you to give to become a WBAI buddy, except BAI listeners like you are on the honor system. So please don't wait. We hope that you'll make that call right now at 516-620-3602 or go to give to WBAI.org. Again, that's give and then the number two, WBAI.org. And if you become a sustaining member of WBAI in the name of Leonard Lopez at large at the $10 level a month or more, We'd be happy to send you a one-year subscription to Mother Jones Magazine, which is a, a fabulous monthly publication that covers literature, politics, culture. It's a perfect fit for listeners to this show and one of the most consistent sources for hard-hitting investigative journalism. So give us that call now. Again, the number, 516-620-3602. Uh, become a sustaining member or whatever level you feel most comfortable. We uh, hope that you will also uh, mention that the donation is in the name of Leonard Lopez at Large, and we thank you for your support. And uh, go back to my two guests, Frank Beecham and George Demas, who are the co-writers of a play called Maverick, which is on stage at the Connolly Theater on, in the East Village until March 2nd. Uh, Mr. Uh, Demas is also the co-director, and he stars as well as you're the only uh, actor in the play who plays only one character. Correct. Uh, well, the, the actor who plays uh, Frank, Stephen Pilkington, he plays Frank and John Houseman. And then beyond that, there's people who play many characters because it's structured as Frank recollecting his his memories of Wells and and everybody including Wells uh, except Frank everybody including Orson Wells is dressed in gray and we put on one or two costume items to represent the people that we're playing the Frank we see in the play is always at Wells beck and call even when the call is at three o'clock in the morning uh, did you feel that whatever Wells asked you you had to say yes to well, what I, I I was constantly being tested. Um, that three o'clock call, um, and, and anyone that knows about the old radio, uh, when you edited reel to reel tape with a razor blade, if it was magnetized, it would cause a pop. Well, that was fairly amateur stuff. But Wells calls me with this seeming problem at three o'clock in the morning. I knew that a man that had practically invented radio would know this, mm-hmm. but he was testing me to see if I knew it. And I, I, I realized it immediately, but this is what he would do. He would try to tease you to see what you knew or didn't know. He sounds like a real piece of work. Oh, he was <laughs> a piece of work. Do you think he got worse as he got older? No, actually, it was interesting because he wanted, when he got into video, he got into video in a big way. He's 70 years old. But I took him to a place called Synclavier, which was one of the first audio editing systems. It was also music. But he was listening to a broken wine glass, and and he said, wait a minute, you guys don't quite have that right. He would uh, question people beyond their belief, and they didn't know that um, that this would happen. So it was uh, really a, uh, a, a guy who wanted his own video editing system. He wanted all of these things that were were really expensive, but he he didn't, uh, he, he was out there. He was ahead of his time. And that's a thread that runs through the play. Wells requesting outrageous stunts and technical tricks that the budgets couldn't support. Well, he just always wanted me to raise more money. <laughs> It was like this trick that he was going to do to put people over the heads of the audience. He had Doug Henning's magic designer do it, and and he wanted $35,000. And he said, Frank, get it. How good was he as a magician? Oh, he was good. He he would uh, play at the Magic Castle, and uh, he would, he he had a, he he loved to do it. He He, he learned it as a kid. He said when when other people, when, when other kids had violin lessons, I learned card tricks. 
because his father gave him magic lessons when he was a boy. But you didn't have to learn how to do magic to play him, did you? No. I mean, I, I, I would have I'd loved to have done that, but we really wanted to do it right. <laughs> we were going to do it, but we didn't, could, didn't have the time or the money. Is it true that he hired an ambulance to take him from place to place because he sure then he did. wouldn't have to stop for red lights? He said wow. that it, it with things like uh, a, a great line, which we have in the play, is uh, art should never be stopped have to stop for a red light <laughs> and he did that and i always felt he, he told me that story with great glee because uh, uh, you never had, you never were in the ambulance with him. oh no no because i it was back this was in the radio days uh-huh. and the way he would get from a theater rehearsal to a uh to a radio show which was you know he would just hit it at the very moment uh, that it was about to start is he would use an ambulance and he found out with no law against it. The other thing that he would do, he would go into the radio studio and he would usually take a fake script and to, to scare everyone, he would drop the, the script on the floor as the show was about to start. And then he would pull out his real script. Uh-huh. And uh, he, he, would, he would absolutely scare those producers to death. Do you think he was self-sabotaging or simply always just wanted to push the envelope? I think it was an ego thing mm-hmm. that he, he enjoyed pushing the envelope in the radio days. I yeah. think also he thrived on chaos and that he could – he felt that he could, he could perform well in a chaotic circumstance and, and kind of get the upper hand. Uh, yeah, no question. I mean, that, that the way with War of the Worlds, when you look at that, it was the chaos that created the winning show. Um, it was never planned. There's a, a scene of a young director named Nicholas having lunch with Wells, and he has made a science fiction film about a space urchin who wants to go home. I'm assuming that's based on Steven Spielberg. And so it's a number of people. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that became a motif. John Carpenter did a movie about that. Nicholas Rogue did a movie about that. So it, it's, a, it's an amalgam of people, and that character is meant to represent the kind of sycophantic director that loved to talk to Wells at lunch but wouldn't help him out. Yeah, because uh, uh, the, that character calls Wells his hero but then refuses to help him or even take his phone calls. Oh yeah, well that happened. Did they see to him, him as a, a nuisance? <laughs> yeah, they they saw him as a as a a way to have a lunch with a historic figure, but they weren't going to help him, and that happened over and over to him. Did they pick up the tab because he ate at expensive restaurants and, uh, as you said, pampered well, that, that's his a pet funny dog? Story. But you were scrambling to raise money for his projects at the same time. I was. What was interesting was the guy that uh, an editor that worked for me freelance had insisted that I pick up the tab always at Wells lunches and I tried to but the voice of God said no you won't and I could not um, I couldn't do it when, when he, the way he was so forceful about it and finally the, there's a scene where he slams his fist on the table and he says do you have the money and I I realized at that very moment, I was if I were going to be a producer, I would have to lie. Hmm. And I did. I lied. I said, yes, I have the money. That day, he let me pick up the tab. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was interesting. Wells died while he was working on uh, the, the final scene of your project. Um, the night before you would begin filming. So what happened to the project? Was it just canceled? Yeah, I got a phone call the next morning from uh, uh, Wells Enforcer, a a guy named Alessandro Tosca, who was a count that had produced one of his shows in Europe. And uh, he he said to me simply, the project has been canceled. Well, you worked with him for less than a year. This play covers pretty much the last months of his life. But did you consider it a formative experience? Oh, it was it was life changing. Because you were turning down other jobs to concentrate oh, yeah, on no. I, I I was look, John Houseman said and, and he was so right, when you have been touched by a real genius, not not the phony ones that people say are geniuses, but when you've been touched by a real genius, it changes your life. Uh it definitely changed my life. Uh no question about it. Now Wells uh, had s- told me the story one day of Cradle Will Rock. And he said to me that if I can't produce it, 
you should consider producing it. And he even said, you shall. And when it was over, that lunch was over, and he died only a, a month or two later, I realized I had to do it. I had to do something. And you got Tim Robbins to do it with I, you. I, I gave the project to Tim Robbins. We worked together on it for, oh, gosh, it went 15 years. But um, I also did Theater of the Imagination. Uh, Wells' people all came out and started to befriend me. I did his memorial service, which we've now got online, uh, has not been seen in 35 years. Uh, I did uh, Theater of the Imagination, which he had left all of his old radio material in a, uh, in a cardboard box in the garage of one of his employees. So it went on and on. And uh, One of the surprises was he says more than once that professionalism isn't always the most important thing. It's not. Not to him. Well, I think you have to look at the the way he was saying it. By professional, he meant being devoted to the occupation. Where, and when he says he's devoted to the amateur approach, it's from the Latin root of the word, which is amor, for the love of it. And that's that's what he meant by that, not by being frayed at the edges, but by doing things with your heart. In this play, you, you have actors moving the sets, sometimes breaking the fourth wall by speaking directly to the audience. Were you trying to incorporate a, a, a sense of experimentation in your system? Absolutely. I mean, I think when we did this, we wanted to do something that was not your kind of standard issue bio play, but something that Wells himself might get a kick out of seeing. And it's trying to, it borrows a little bit from some of his funkier work that he did later in his life, like F for Fake and um, Other Side of the Wind and things like that. You have a company of six actors, all except you, playing more than one role. Mm -hmm. Everyone from cameraman and reporters to celebrities like Robin Leach, Zsa Zsa Gabor, and Merv Griffin. Is that a challenge that most actors welcome? Oh, yes. I mean, it's something where, uh, you know, we just jump in and it's part of the joy of the, this a kind of a more imaginative approach to, to that simply someone puts on a hat and they assert by force of will, I am this person. And if they believe it, we hope the audience goes along on the ride with them. And it's uh, it's really about confidently, you know, striding into the role and, and, and adopting it immediately and with confidence. There are some shocking moments. Uh, Wells isn't the only one who acts out. Mac Mundy's portrayal of Robin Leach shows the uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous hosts snorting cocaine and even grabbing a female engineer at a recording session. Uh, was Is that based on your experiences with him? Exactly. It is. Wow. Um, Robin once uh, asked me to get some cocaine that he had left in the back of a, co a cab. And I refused because I wasn't going to go down for him. But, uh, no, he was uh, an interesting cat. And um, I, uh, I, I had one foot. I always kind of felt I had one foot in the sewer and another in Nirvana because I was just torn between these two forces. And uh, he was not a, a, a fun guy to work for, I uh, must say. We also, too, they, you the offices of Television Matrix, Frank's company, was on a lot where they shot uh, soap operas, and he would, didn't he promise some soap oh, opera yeah. actress that she could be on the show and asked you to interview her? And yeah, it was I all would nonsense. end up interviewing the soap opera actresses that he was trying to uh, have an affair with, and the tapes would always go on the shelf somewhere in the back because he never intended to let them... Uh, it, the there show. was a snarky side of him on that show, so I always felt a little uncomfortable. Um, maybe he just couldn't hide who he really was. No, he didn't hide it. it that's him. And uh, he, uh, I think up until he died, you know, it was, uh, that big, was him. Big Trump fan. He was a commentator for Fox News. What, was you know. Touch of, of Evil his last story film? Wells' last story film? It was the last film uh, done by a studio. Now, it's a masterpiece. Oh, it is a masterpiece. And yet he didn't get any projects after that. He had a long career as an actor. He did narrations. Uh, he did commercials, uh, I guess, to, to pay the bills. But no more story fil studio well, films. The reason the studio felt it was too highbrow. He kept him out of it. He edited it to the end. And we have a scene in the uh, story about uh, this producer, Ed Mule, uh, Ed Mull, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. We, we, we've now learned the pronunciation of his name. He uh, 
you know, he basically said that a number of producers had lost their jobs uh, giving Wells that creative freedom during the uh, Citizen Kane era, and he wasn't going to lose his. Uh-huh. And, and there was not a contract like Wells's in terms of creative control before him nor after. And I'm sure that, and when I was talking earlier about the studio heads getting together, I'm sure that it was uh, a, an industry maxim not to give anyone that kind of creative control again. And he, one more thing that, that George didn't say is he wrote a 58-page memo that became the new film that we see today. Uh, so the film that has been re-edited to Wells' original uh, plan um, came from what he did afterwards. So it has been restored, unlike Magnificent Ambersons. He uh, made other films, but not through the studios, and he did pitch tapes for investors. Was this something that he came up with? Yeah, he, he, he wanted people to, to finance his films, and... I mean, he tried to do Cradle of Rock, and the money fell apart. Uh, in all the cases, people just, it, it, he could never hold it together. His last film, The Other Side of the Wind, was released just last year, more than 30 years after his death. What's that film about? And uh, when did oh, that's he begin a good it? Question. Why did it's it take so a, long to be finished? Well, it's about an older director uh, uh, at the end of his career, and, and Peter Bogdanovich plays a young director, and, and a, a John Huston plays the older director. People contend it's uh, autobiographical. Well, um, Wells at the time said that it, it wasn't. Well, he was um, using real people who probably were going through similar experiences. Yes, yes. It's a, it has... <laughs> a, a, Wells is kind of the inventor of meta, and or maybe who knows the ancient Greeks were I don't know, but that but he was doing a, a lot of meta twists in in that film. So how did it come to be finished? Who did, who worked on it? Well, it went on for years. In fact, after he died, his memorial service, I was I had to edit three minutes of it together. There were cutaways that were done five years apart. I mean, it was hmm. the the look of it was uh, all over the place. Only through he didn't digital. do it with beta, beta cam, did he? No, no, <laughs> he did it on film. But the problem was he did it in different times. He did it with different film stocks. Uh, only through digital technology in recent times could they make it anything. And the biggest problem with it was that the film was initially financed by the Pahlavi family, the Shah of mm-hmm. Iran's family, and when the Ayatollah uh, took over, it was seized as a part of his as part of his estate and was put in a vault in France, and Wells, for years, uh, was fighting to get the footage back. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, when an agreement was come to, they, uh, they were able to, b- between, I think, Beatrice Wells, Oya Kodar, and whatever that company was that was financed by the Shah, they were able to get the footage out and begin this project on Netflix of trying to get this labyrinthine (laughs) film put together and put on Netflix. But we don't know that this was Wells' film, and I think that's an important thing that people say it's his last film. He didn't do it. Um, It it was done by others, and... um, one look, I looked at that film and I swore it couldn't be done. John Houseman, uh, John Houston was asked to finish it. He re- refused because he didn't think it could be done. So, uh, you know, uh, there was another film uh, that was done when he went to um, Latin America during Amberson. It's all true. And it, it was never the original Wells film. It was just parts of it. However, though, I don't think that they were entirely flying blind because Bogdanovich, who had, was in it and had talked for hours and hours with Wells about it, I believe had some role in it. But again, yeah, un- unless it was Wells editing it, it'd be, be hard to get what he imagined. Okay, well, what about this play? We're pretty much out of time, but uh, it's only scheduled to run at the Connolly Theater at 220 East 4th Street in the East Village until March 2nd. Any plans to take it to other venues? Well, I'll say this. I think George plays Orson Welles better than any actor I've ever seen. And I I predict that he'll be doing a film or he'll take it other places. I I really mean that because having known Welles, I I, I tell you, he actually scares me sometimes. 
Uh, so I, uh, I I do believe it'll have a future life. As certainly at George is playing Orson. I don't know about the play as it is now, but uh, is, I hope people will come see. Is a project like that pal. in the work? <laughs> Pardon? Is a project like that in the work? No, we're cool. just uh, trying to f- focus on f- finishing up very strong with with what we're doing right now. Well, so. thank you both so much for being on our show, Frank Beecham and George Dimas. Can I plug the site for oh, tickets? Please. Uh, MaverickThePlay.com. MaverickThePlay. Well, that's easy com. enough to remember. Yes. MaverickThePlay is one word. Correct. Dot com. Yes. Thanks again. Thank right. you. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of today's show. My great thanks to Frank Beecham and George Dimas, to Barbara Kahn, who produced the segment, to Reggie Johnson, who was at the audio controls, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, and to my executive producer, Jesse Lent. Modern Lopez and Large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week.